Romans chapter number 11, and uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 now. I'm also going to be in um, Exodus 32 <clears throat> for a big part of it tonight, uh, so we're not, we're not going to read that whole chapter right now. But anyway, Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Uh, so let's all stand out of respect to God's word, Romans 11, 1 through 5. <clears throat> I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not that what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of God. I, I just want to I want to share my heart, and I have worked hard over the years to study the Bible. I, I got saved. You know, most of you know I got saved out of a, out of a Catholic background, and and um, uh, been a been a Christian now for 35 years. And I think about that. Now, some of you have been saved longer than me. I know that. But even so, 35 years is a long time to be saved. 35 years is, is if you multiply that by 365 days, that's how many days I've been, how many, how many days I've been in the Bible since I've been saved. That's a lot of Bible. Okay. I've been to church for 35 years. I've heard a lot of different preachers. I've heard some of the greatest preachers that have ever lived on the face of this earth. I've heard some of the preachers, preachers that God has had his hand on. Uh, in a tremendous ways. In fact, in ways you don't see anymore. Are you listening to me? Now, what I'm going to say tonight, I just said in ways you don't see anymore. What I'm going to say tonight is one of the reasons why you don't see it anymore. Okay? <clears throat> um, so, I say all that, and, and, and I've really tried hard. I mean, I, I'm nowhere near the Christian I ought to be. I know that. And, but uh, but I, I studied. When I got saved, I had a choice. I had a choice between going down... The, what back in the Midwest was called the New Evangelical Path, the Liberal Path, or to walk down the, the, the Bible Path. And I knew the Bible Path was what we would call a strict path. I knew that. But I, I, I decided that I wanted to know which way to go. And I looked at the lives of the Christians who were walking down the New Evangelical Path, which is basically a liberal Christian path, a watered-down Christian path. And I looked at the people who were walking down the strict path, I guess is the way some people would say it, and I, and I looked at both of those and I said, you know what real Christianity is? You know what I read in the Bible? I read that narrow is the way. Right. Narrow is the way. So I chose that path. And I chose to follow the preachers that were, were, were on that path. And I chose to follow the Christians as my example that were on that path. And I know that I've got, a, I've got some uh, time left. My family's got some time left on this earth. I don't know how long. But so far, so good. And I look at the Christianity of today, and I'm talking about, when I refer to Christianity today, I don't really want to talk about the watered-down stuff. I'm talking about our kind of church. And I look at the Christianity of today, and I'll tell you what, what, what's being turned out today, I'll take my way any day. Are you listening to me? I'll take the old-time way any day. It works. It works. So what I'm talking to you about tonight. You, you, I guarantee you, not everybody in this room is going to agree with everything I say. I promise you that. But I want to challenge you to look at your way and look at this way and see which way works. Because I tell you, the way, I'm, the way I'm talking about tonight, this works. I've seen it work in the lives of other people. I've seen it work in my life. So I'm not talking about something that I have looked at. I've looked at it and I've lived it, and I'm telling you it works. I'm just going to share my heart tonight with you about this. I want you to listen with your heart and with a yielded spirit. This is vital, as I said this morning, to our future. It really is. Uh, we are, our country is in big trouble. Our country is going downhill fast. And really, it's all on us. It's all on us. Because how, listen to me, how we live determines if the blessing of God is on our country. And I'll tell you what. 
I see the blessing of God on America less and less. So it must be, hear me now, it must be the Christians are going backwards and not forward. And I want, and what I'm going to say tonight is largely the reason why. So I'm going to ask you tonight to, to listen with your heart. And, and, okay, again, you may walk out here tonight and say, I don't agree with what he said. But I want to challenge you to, to, to try to find some holes in, in the way that we, that we believe. You called me here as pastor four years ago, and somebody said the other day, you were looking for an older guy. You got one. <laughs> I've been down the road. I know what I'm talking about. You see what I mean? I know what it's like to live the Christian life. I've pastored. I've watched people go both ways. I've watched people hold on to some of the beliefs that I'm going to fight against tonight. And I've watched the people hold on to the beliefs that I'm going to hold to tonight. And I've seen the way their lives turn out. I know what I'm talking about. The reason why I listened to my pastor is because he was a lot older than me. Are you listening? He had been a Christian a lot longer than me. He studied the Bible a lot longer. Plus, he had counseled 150 people a week. I I just got the impression he knew what he was talking about. Sometimes he would hold up his little finger and say, look at that. There's more, there's more brains in that little finger than, than some of you teenagers' whole body. And all he was talking about was his experience, the things that he's learned because he was in his 60s. And yet there were Christians that sat out there and thought they knew more about Christianity than he did. I, you see what I'm saying? That's not true. Can I tell you something? You teenagers don't know more about Christianity than I do. You adults that that are in your 20s and 30s, you don't know more about Christianity than I do. You don't know what works yet. You haven't seen it. You haven't had the test of time. And I have. You see, I've stayed the course. I've held my ground. And people have tried to push me off the course. People have tried to argue with me. They tried to reason with me about my standards, about my beliefs. And I've held the course. And I'm telling you, it works. It works. But we're in trouble. America's in trouble. It is. We are. We're, and I, and I, I look at my three little grandkids and I'm scared. I'm scared for what they're going to have to grow up in. And I'm not just so much scared for what they're going to have to grow up in in the country. I'm scared of what they have to grow up in the church. You see? <clears throat> okay, so let's go to Exodus 32. And in this passage, Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments from God. And the people are down below, listen to me, doing what they want to do. It's exactly what they're doing. They're doing what they want to do. They don't want to wait for Moses. So they said, we're just going to do what we want to do. And so they begin to put the pressure on. Look at Exodus 32, verse 1. And the Bible says, now again, I, I'm probably, I just want to let you know, I don't want to make you mad. I, I don't want to, I don't want to get you upset. Unless you need to get upset and make some changes in your life. And, and, and I, I don't like preaching this kind of sermon because I, I go out in the lobby and I, and I want to hide in that pulpit. Really, because I'm, I'm very sensitive. But see, I I just love you too much. And and this this has been going on. This has been working in my heart for weeks. I I hear things. I see things. And and I I look and see what the Bible says. And I look and see what Christianity used to be like. What it is today. I'm talking, again, I'm talking about our kind. The Bible kind. And, 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 And I know why. I know why this is. I see why it is. Exodus 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. <clears throat> for as for this Moses, the, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. 
They said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. <coughs> we'll, we'll worship the false gods today, and tomorrow we'll get to, the, to, get to God. And they rose up early on the morrow and burnt offerings and brought the peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink, drink and rose up to play. Now here's what's happening here. And I'm not going to get into all the story and all the details. I just want to get this message across to you. They are pressuring <coughs> a man of God to go against God and follow their ways. They are pressuring, they are leading a man of God to go against God and follow their false gods. They're leading Aaron. They're putting pressure on Aaron to go against God and follow their false gods. And you know, that's what I feel like sometimes in this new Christianity. I feel like I must follow the crowd. The crowd that listens to Christian contemporary music and sings it. The crowd that dresses like the opposite sex. The crowd that dresses like the world and undresses like the world. And I'm going to be very plain tonight, okay? I'm talking about the low tops, girl ladies. I'm talking about the low tops, all right? That's acceptable today, and I'm talking about our kind of church. Now, it's not acceptable with God, but it's acceptable in our kind of church. And I'm talking about the short skirts, the skirts that, are, that don't even cover the knee. So when you sit down, they go up high. That's what I'm talking about. That kind of stuff. I'm being pressured uh, by Christians all everywhere, and they're not. Nobody's coming to me and saying, "You got to believe this. You got to believe this. You got to believe this." No, it's just that so many people are doing it, and when everybody's doing it, you feel like you got to do it too, or you're a weirdo. You see, uh, the, the 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 people that think it's okay to go to beaches. Now, by the way, not just the short skirts, the tight skirts too. Tight skirts. We think it's we think just because you wear a skirt, you're okay. What about the tight skirt? It's modesty, folks. The crowd that thinks it's okay to go to beaches. For the life of me, for the life of me, I don't understand how a Christian can think it's okay to go to a place where people walk around nine-tenths naked, show their bodies off, and you think it's okay to sit there and look at that stuff. You say, if you're a man, you say, it doesn't bother me. Uh, don't shake my hand after the service because I don't want to shake yours. I'm serious about that. Uh, honestly, there's something wrong with a man who says it doesn't bother me to look at a woman like that. There's something wrong with a woman who doesn't mind her husband looking at that. You call it security. I call it crazy. By the way, God said in the book, book of Leviticus, you're not supposed to look at other people's nakedness. Leviticus 18. Awful quiet in here already, and I'm not even getting started yet. <clears throat> I must follow the crowd, the crowd that, that, say, that says that they can miss church once in a while and still be allowed to teach Sunday school, still be allowed to sing up here, still be allowed to serve in this church. <clears throat> Faithfulness has nothing to do with whether or not you get to serve. Soul winning has nothing, whether you go soul winning or not, has nothing to do with whether or not you get to serve. Separation has nothing to do with whether or not you get to serve. That's exactly the kind of pressure that's coming on people who believe the old time ways. People that think it's okay to have an occasional drink of alcohol. You can go to movies, go to beaches, go to dances, whatever, and still do things in the church. There's no separation from the world or very little from the world. There is no teachableness. Everyone knows it all. The pastor, it's just his opinion. Well, let me just say this and let you hear this real good, okay? This is one preacher right here that's not going to make a golden calf a bail for you. You understand what I'm saying? I am not going to make a golden calf of bail and let you bow down to it. If you do it, it won't be me making it. I think I broke my hand. Anyway, <clears throat> I am not going to compromise the convictions. You're looking at one preacher who's not going to compromise the convictions he learned from the Bible years ago. 
And just because it's 2014, I'm not going to change. You knew what you were getting when you got me. I did not hide anything from what I believed. You asked me pointed questions. I answered the questions. You know exactly where I stand on things. If you were here when, you, when I got interviewed for the job. Look at verse 7 and 8. The Bible says here, The Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which, brought thou, thou, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, we read in Romans chapter 11, verse 5, 4, where, where Elijah said, or God said to Elijah, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. These people in Exodus 32 were bowing their knee to the image of Baal. They were bowing their knee to a false god. <clears throat> and I wonder tonight, <clears throat> is there anybody left? Are, whose knee are you bowing to tonight? Who are you bowing down to? Are you bowing down to Baal? Or are you bowing down to Jesus? The Lord told Moses in verse 7 and 8, the people have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of God's way. They have given credit to this false God for their deliverance from Egypt. And God looks at Christianity today and compares it with, with biblical Christianity and says they have corrupted themselves. They have mixed in a whole bunch of the world with the Bible and come up with this watered down mess that frankly this needy world does not want. Look at verse 9. Now, if you're, not, if you're bound down to the Lord and not bound down to Baal, you've got nothing to worry about. But if you're bound down to Baal with, with your life, you need the false gods. You need to get, some, you need to get something squared tonight. It's really important you do that. Verse 9. The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. God said it is a stiff-necked people. And can, you, can I tell you something? I see more and more of that in Christianity today. Uh, in uh in churches today, the stiff-necked people. I've talked to, I was talking to an assistant pastor this week, or they're looking for a pastor in their church, and he said, he was telling me about the situation, and he's, they're not coming, coming after me at all. I mean, he's, a, he's my convert. I'm counseling him through this time. He's, he's leading a church, just lost their pastor, and I'm helping him out to, to try to find another pastor and to get through this whole situation. And he's telling me about situations going on, and I'm telling you, it's just something that's everywhere. Stiff-necked people. Know-it-all people. Know it all. They have preconceived ideas of the way it's supposed to be. They're stubborn, not teachable or changeable. They say, why can't we do this or that? Why do we have to do this or that? They fight everything. Everything. <clears throat> they will sign standard sheets to work in the church and still do whatever they want to do. There's no honor. There's no integrity. You see? I mean, we're bowing our knee to bail. That's what we're doing. And the preachers of today, are uh, the, the ones that are staying by the stuff, are looking around and saying, are we just standing alone? Are we by ourselves? Is there no one left that has not bowed the knee to Baal? Is there no one left that's brought down the watered junk of the world and the watered down junk of the so-called Christian churches and brought it into our fundamental churches? Is there no other place like like? left that the way it's supposed to be is everything is everybody bowing their knee to bail sad really sad look at verses 10 through 14 look at how God responds to this he says here now therefore let me alone he's telling God's telling Moses this that my wrath may wax hot against them that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation and Moses besought the Lord his God and said why doth thy and said Lord why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed. And they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. God wants to destroy them. Moses gets to God to give them another chance. Now I want to thank God tonight. We still have some old-fashioned, true, Bible-believing Christians who are praying for mercy for all of us. 
I'm thank, I thank God for that. That's what's holding back God's wrath. He sees, that's what the, Egypt, the, the, the Israelites were doing. They were taking the gods of the Egyptians and making a golden calf and bowing down to them. And they even mentioned the Lord in the midst of all this. So they're adding their, 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 their false gods and their worship of the false gods in with the worship of God. And that's what God sees today in our churches. He sees so much of the world coming into our churches. If it wasn't for the prayers of some godly Christians who stand by the truth, God would destroy this land. Verses 15 through 20. Go there, Exodus chapter 32, verse 15 through 20. It says here, Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, so that the one side on the other were they written. The tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout from mastery you, is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. They're really enjoying themselves. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink of it. You know what the average Christian would have said today? What's wrong with what we're doing? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with our dancing around the calf? What's wrong with us dancing naked around the calf? What's wrong with the music we're playing? That's what the average Christian would have said. God's man is angry at the sight of those people bowing the knee to Baal. And I can tell you, can I tell you tonight, it angers and sickens me when I see Christians bowing to Baal and falling for his deception and lies because they don't really want to know what God says. Would rather conform as much to this world as they can get away with and still claim to be Christian. I read in my Bible many times, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. That's what it says. Be not conformed to this world. Don't conform to the ways of this world. Be as much unlike the world as you possibly can. Then look at verse 21 through 25 says here, Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. But they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and they cast in, I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. When Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Moses confronts his compromising man of God brother. Uh, Aaron was pressured into this. Aaron was pushed and pushed into this. Aaron was told, was, was, was kept hearing from the people, we, we don't know what's going on with Moses. Make us this calf. They were persistent. And he gave in to that. And Moses confronts his compromising brother. Let me tell you tonight, there are so many preachers who are compromising. Now listen, I saw what works. Are you listening to me? I saw what works to make a God-blessed, thriving church. I heard what works. And it's not compromising. Compromising does not work. Compromising does not Bring the blessings of God. If you want Satan's blessings, then compromising will work. But if you want God's blessings, you've got to be so far away from compromising. You cannot conform to this world. You cannot compromise. As you are conforming to this world, you are taking a trail of compromising. <laughs> we'll have a little bit of God, a little bit of the world. A little bit more of the world, a little bit of God. It's the way it works. But I see preachers today who are lowering their standards. <clears throat> now, you're going to think I'm nuts, but I'm just telling you. I'm telling you tonight, and I wish you'd listen to me. I know what works. I see what works. Preachers lowering their standards doesn't work. 
But I see preachers in our, in our, in our circles today, lowering their standards. They don't require uh, men to wear ties for soul winning anymore. There's no dressing up for soul winning. People go out knocking on doors dressed like slobs. Dressed so informal. You think they're going to take their kids to the park instead of representing the king of kings at a door. <clears throat> Music is becoming worldly more and more in our churches. I mean, we're seeing Rock and roll bands in fundamental churches today. It all starts with just lowering the music standard just a little bit. Changing Bibles. Easier to understand Bibles. By the way, you know why I understand the Word of God? Because the Holy Ghost of God lives in me. The teacher lives inside me. The teacher, the master teacher. That's how I can understand the Word of God. Not because I'm reading a version that's easy to understand. No preaching in some services. Preachers are, 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 are canceling preaching in some services and just having testimony times or just having movies instead. No door-to-door soul winning. Preachers, listen to me, preachers are skipping church for hunting trips and for fishing trips and for cruises. They're skipping church. And these are our leaders. What else can you expect from the followers if that's what the leaders are doing? They are just like Aaron. Just like Aaron. And I want to tell you tonight, I don't care what you think about me, but I want to tell you what I think. It's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong to compromise. It's wrong to lower the standards. If anything in our life, if we are, listen to me, if we're growing as Christians, our standards are going to get higher, not lower. Our holiness is going to get more and more like God and less and less, farther and farther rather, away from the world. Not closer to it. So here's my question for you. Exodus 32. Who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? Who in this room is on the Lord's side. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. We read the scripture. Is there not no one left who has not bowed to Baal and will not bow to Baal? Is there no one left that has not bowed down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel chapter 3 and will not bow down to that statue? Is there a remnant of uncompromising, old-fashioned, King James, soul-winning, separated local church Christians who have not and will not bow, who are clearly and uncompromisingly on the Lord's side? Is there anybody left like that? Are you one of them? Where are those who have not and will not bow to bed? Where are those who have not and will not bow to Baal in worship? I mean, really. Can you really worship God with a worldly entertainment at church? Where are those who will not bow to Baal in church? What is the right church? Are all churches okay? That's what people seem to think. Where are those who have not and will not bow to Baal in dress? Does God really care? I mean, is it really okay for men to dress like women in women's clothes and, and men, women and to dress in men's clothes? Is that really okay? Is it really okay to show your bosom or your thighs? Is it really okay to show your body at a beach or a pool? Is that really okay? Is God really okay with undressing in public? I mean, really, think about this. If you went, if you walked down the street, in the same thing you wear as a bathing suit, if you walk down the street in a different color, you'd be arrested. But it's okay if it's pink or red or, or you wear a bikini, it's okay. Tell me that makes sense. I mean, that's how crazy this society is and that's how crazy Christians are. I mean, it's okay. It's okay to do that. Is, but I ask you tonight, is it really all right? In music, is it really okay as long as the words are Christian? You play music that sounds like rock, the rock and roll of the world. In faithfulness, do you really have to go to every service, four services a week, to be right with God? I mean, what does Hebrews 11.25 really mean? 
Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. What does that really mean? You see? In Bibles. What are those, where are those who will not and will not bow to Baal in Bibles? Is the old King James really the inspired, perfect, preserved word of God and the only right English Bible? Who, where are those who will have not and will not bow to Baal in authority? Do, do, do we really have pastoral authority in church? Do we really have the father authority in the home? Where are those who have, will not and have not bowed to Baal in entertainment? Is it really okay to go to movies? Do you really have enough character to walk out on a movie, even though it might be a good movie and there's nothing wrong with it? Do you really have enough character to walk out if, if you spend all that money and all of a sudden there comes a bad preview on the screen? Do you really have enough care to, character to walk out of that? By the way, you say, well, I do. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Is it really okay to go to a beach with all the nakedness around or a pool? Is it really okay to watch cable TV? You say, I can control it. What if you're wrong? Is it really okay to read books and watch TV that have cussing in it and talk about and show nakedness and immorality? Is it really okay to drink alcohol? Is it really okay to gamble with, with uh, God's given money? So I can do that. I, I, I won't get addicted. What if you're wrong? When it comes to friendships, is it really okay to hang around with people who ignore or defy the Bible and God, whether they're Christian or unsaved? Is that really okay? Where are those who have not and will not bow to Baal? I'm telling you today, today's Christians, a huge majority of the ones that go to a church like this <clears throat> would go along with all the answers that are okay, that okay a watered-down, world-like life. That's sad. You want to know why we are the way we are? You want to know why the country is the way it is? Because Christians are bowing the knee. Elijah took a strong stand against Baal and Ahab, false prophets. When it was over, he said to God, there's nobody left. I'm the only one. God said, I got good news for you, Elijah. I got 7,000. God say that tonight. Can you look at the people that go to Liberty Baptist Church and say, I got a bunch of people who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. I hope so. But I'll tell you what, the average person, Christian, has made, I'm not talking about the Life Center crowd, I'm not talking about the Champion Center crowd, I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about us. I'm talking about this type of Christianity. That's the type that I watch, that's the type that I hang around, that's the type that I see, that's the type that I listen to. They have made up this Christian God who's okay with all this. They really believe it's okay. They really believe it. He's okay with any kind of worship. Although, although the Bible says they to worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's okay with any kind of church. Despite Matthew 16, 18 that said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And we see a clear outline of what church is supposed to be like in the book of Acts. He's okay with any kind of dress for men or women or children, despite what Deuteronomy 22, 5 says, despite about wearing things that are of their opposite sex, despite Leviticus 18 that condemns the showing of your nakedness. Now, again, I want to just tell you something. Women, when you show off your top part, by the way, when you dress like that to church, I mean, it ought to be, it ought to be when you lean over, men can't see anything by accident. But that's not happening today in our churches. It's insane. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to scream about it until I die. And if you come to church dressed like that, and you come to church with a skirt that when you sit down it hikes up way up and shows your thigh, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to scream about it until you get it right. Oh, he gets older, he'll get quieter. I wouldn't count on it. You check out my preaching from 1980s. It's the same type. I haven't changed in 30 years. Why change now? And it's sad. It sickens me. It, it bothers me that men of God are not preaching like this anymore. It's really sad. They don't have enough guts to look their people in the eye and tell them these things. 
You know, I'm taking a chance. This could be my swan song. This damn means goodbye, Pastor. We don't need you around here anymore. That's okay. Me and my wife will go down in Florida, put on a pair of shorts, and sh- play shuffleboard. <coughs> no, we won't do that because I look terrible in a pair of shorts. They'll say he's okay with any kind of music, despite all the Bible says about godly music. I'm not a music expert. But I've heard Christian contemporary music. And, and, I, and I've read the music in the Bible. I've read about the music in the Bible. And I'll tell you what, just from reading the mu- about the music in the Bible and, and listening to Christian contemporary music and hearing it, especially when I first got saved, it doesn't fit the music you see in the Bible. And you know it doesn't. God said be careful what you hear anyway. Be careful what you hear. And that stuff, let me tell you why the devil raised that up. The devil didn't raise that up to worship God. The devil raised that up to whet your appetite for rock and roll. That's exactly what he did. You can argue with me all you want about that and give me your philosophies and tell me why you're right, even though you're 30 years younger than me. and You haven't experienced the things I've experienced. You don't know the things that I know. You haven't seen the things I've seen. But I'm telling you tonight <clears throat> that I know exactly what I'm talking about. I've seen this stuff, and I've seen Christianity go downhill, and when the standards loosen up, that's when things start going down. And I'll tell you why the standards loosen up. Because Christians are bowing their knee to Baal. You see... These Christians are okay with any kind of faithfulness. Despite 1 Corinthians 4, 2, where it says it's required in, in, man that, uh, in stewards that a man be found faithful. But this new Christian idea of faithfulness is this. I'm there most of the time. Well, if my wife faithful to me most of the time, I'm not satisfied with that. He says, well, honey, I've only cheated on you three or four times this year. That's not too bad. I'm not happy with that. I don't know a husband who would be. And there ain't a wife on the earth that would be happy with that comment. Well, how many times you cheat on me this, this, this year, dear? Well, honey, I've only done it six times. Oh, great. Wow, you're improving. No, but see, that's exactly the way Christians look at faithfulness. I was taught faithfulness means, listen to me, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Whether you're in your church, whether you're out of town, you go to church, you be in your place to hear God's Word. That's the way it's supposed to be. You show me the Christian today who thinks like that. I sent a questionnaire to missionaries, to our missionaries, and I wrote on there. I wrote, one of the questions I wrote was this. I said, I said, do you think it's wrong for a Christian to ever miss church unless they're sick for any reason at all. And I, I had one missionary get offended at stuff like that. Well, the reason why you get offended is because you think it's okay to miss church. I mean, it's okay to go golfing when church is going on. It's okay to sit home and watch a movie. When, show me that in the Bible. You give me that kind of Christianity, and I'll give you a watered-down group that's going downhill fast, and a country that's going downhill fast. I can miss church once in a while, despite Hebrews 10.25, where it tells me to not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. But I can miss it once in a while. I can miss it when I'm on vacation. I can miss it when the family's over. I can miss it when other things are going on. I can miss it... Now, hear me now. Hear me now. I'm going to... I'm going to tread on some delicate ground. You know what bothers me? Christians are sick on Sunday. They're at work on Monday. You know what I think? Tell me if I'm wrong. But I think this. I think they think, well, God will understand, but my boss won't. I'd hate to stand before God and God said, you missed church on this day, but you went to work the next day. You felt the same way. So what you're saying is God, your work is more important than God. It's more important you go to work and, and report for your job than it is that you report to God's house and hear God's word. 
more important that you, you obey your boss than you obey God. You see what I mean? But yet, there's Christians in, in our, in our, in our watered down, uh, world, in our watered down churches. That's exactly the kind of thinking we have. I mean, Proverbs 28, 9 says, <clears throat> if you turn away your ear from hearing the word of God, your prayer shall be abomination. You know what that means? When you knowingly and willingly turn your ear away from hearing God's word. And you know, when you don't, when you don't go to church, you turn your, away your ear from hearing God's word. Your prayer makes God sick. That's what that says. Christians today are okay. Now, again, let me remind you, when I'm talking about Christians, I'm talking about our kind. With any kind of Bible, they're okay with any kind of Bible, despite Psalm 12, 6, and 7, which says God said he'll preserve his words, and God's incredible blessing on the King James Bible, and the incredible evidence against all the other versions, Christians still say any, any kind of Bible's okay. <clears throat> Christians will say... <clears throat> That, that, that every, it's okay. You don't have to listen to follow what the pastor says. I don't have to follow what he says. They, they have a problem with authority, you see. I don't have to follow what the pastor says. After all, he's just a man. Now, when you look at me and you say he's just a man, no truer words were ever spoken. That's all I am, is just a man. But I want you to take note of Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to take note of this. Hebrews chapter 13. The Bible says here, <clears throat> remember them which have the rule over you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. He said, when you look at their life, if their testimony matches, if their walk matches their talk, then follow their faith. And obey, follow, do what they tell you. Alright? Verse 17 says, Obey them which have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. God said, obey them. God said, do what they tell you to do. Now listen, I think that when you said, I want Pastor Richter to be my pastor, you were saying, I believe he stands for the Word of God. I believe he's going to tell me what God says. And if that's what you thought, if that's what you believe, then you ought to do what I preach. Are you listening to me? I'm not God. I don't claim to be God. But that, I got two verses right there in the Bible that says you are to obey the man of God when he says to do something. But we question authority today. I mean, I'm telling you, I've never seen a generation like this that questions authority. Question, when it comes to, uh, <clears throat> to, the, to the role in the home. Women, you have a, you have a, got a husband and, a, and you, you got a husband, wife, and a kid situation. And that situation where, where God, God tells about what to do, God says women are submit themselves to their own husbands. But yet, you fight that. You see? It's amazing. <clears throat> but they have, Christians have made up this Christian God who's okay with that. They made up this Christian God who's okay with the entertainment of the world. Even though Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. That's what he said. You see, so I have a hard time believing that it's safe to go to movie houses. By the way, back when Christians didn't go to movies, people were holier and purer. And they, that might not be the only reason, but I want to tell you, it was one of them. It was one of them. But yet we lowered that standard, and we've lowered the standard on what we watch on TV. We have cable TV. We look at all the trash and the filth, and we sit there and say, well, I'll fast forward through the naked parts. I'll fast forward through the cussing. Hey, you may think, you may think that's okay, but God said, no, don't set anything that's wrong before your eyes. Movies that are ungodly anywhere, home or theater, are wrong. Bars and beaches and places like that. I mean, we're bowing our knee to Baal. I can't believe I can't believe some of the movies I hear Christians talk about that they watch or that they go see. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I just can't believe it. I mean, it's got cuss in it. It's got bad bad things in it. Yet we still go. We think it's okay because most of it is good. But God said, "I will set no wicked thing before my eyes." 
Boy, it's awful quiet in here. You still love me? Don't answer that. This Christian God we've made up is okay with friendship. Okay with friendships, worldly friendships. Despite Psalm, Proverbs 13.10. And, and I just, you know, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how many Christians have got worldly friends. You're hanging around with people who ignore and defy the Bible. You have friends like that. And God said, don't have them. He said in Proverbs 13.20, He that walk with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That's what God said. Let me just read you some more of what God said about this. In Psalm 1.1, 1, 1, He said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Then He said in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 14, are you listening, young people, teenagers? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Proverbs 4.14 Enter not to the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. That's what God said to do. Get away from it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. The Bible says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to, listen to what Paul said. He said, but, but I know I have written unto you that not to keep company. If any man be, uh, any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul said this. It seems like God's trying to get a, a point across to us here. He says in chapter 3, verse 14, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, if any man obey not the word of God, he said, note that man, mark that man, and have no company with him, he may be ashamed. That's what God said to do. God said, I don't want you hanging around the wrong crowd. I don't want you hanging around the ungodly crowd, Christian or not Christian. But yet, we keep our friends. We keep our friends. Psalm 119 David put it like this. Verse 63. Listen to what David said. David said, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precept. I think David knows a little bit more about this than we do, don't you think? I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says here, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He says, I thank God for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. That's who Paul fellowshiped with. He fellowshiped with those that were of the faith. First John 1 John 1.7 says, when we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. When you're walking in the light, when you're obeying God, and I'm obeying God, we have fellowship one with another. That's what God said. You see? So I ask you tonight, who's on the Lord's side? The Lord of this book. If the Lord of this book, see this, this book, he be God, follow him. Follow him. And don't try to make him into a God that fits who you want him to be. Don't try to conform God to your image. You are to conform to His image. Quit messing around. Quit playing games. But if Baal, then follow Him. So many Christians have shown with their life, and compared to the, remember this? Remember this? Remember this? The Holy Bible. They show with their life that they have decided to bow their knees to Baal. How sad. I ask tonight, is there a remnant? The word remnant means a remainder or a group of people left. It mentions that in Romans 11, verse 5. Is there a remnant, a remainder, or a group of people that have not bowed their knee to the modern God of Christianity, but rather have humbly and sincerely bowed their knee to the true God of the Bible? Listen, I've seen this type of Christianity that works and the type that doesn't work. Are you listening to me? Look up here. I have seen the type of Christianity that works and that doesn't work. Doesn't that mean anything? Doesn't that mean anything? God says about remnants, the remainder. And and, and I admit, I I admit, I'm in the minority. I admit that. Totally admit that I'm in the minority. 
And, and I don't mind being the minority. I've been the minority since I got saved and decided to walk this way. I mean, I've been around a lot of Christians. I know there's a lot of Christians in America. They're not as much as there should be, but there's a lot. And I know that our that Bible type of Christianity, the kind of Christianity I'm talking about tonight, that is not bowed the knee to Baal, that is in the minority. I understand that. But praise God, I'm not by myself. There are a lot that have not bowed the knee. There's a remnant. No remnant, Isaiah 1 9 means the destruction of Christianity as the Bible knows. You hear that? If there's nobody left, we can forget it. If there's nobody that's going to walk like I'm talking about, there's nobody that's going to stand where I'm talking about standing tonight, we can forget it. Because I, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> I don't see, I don't think Christianity is getting stronger. I think it's getting weaker. But we can turn it around tonight. We can turn it around. We can get on our knees before the God of the Bible and tell Him we're sorry for bowing down to our knees to Baal, but we're not going to do that anymore. From now on, we're going to bow to the true God of the Holy Bible. Isaiah eleven sixteen. God will provide a way for those who are left to keep doing right. I don't have to worry about it. He'll provide a way for me to keep obeying Him. Well, Isaiah 37, 4, we need to pray for those who are left. Jeremiah 6, 9, the remnant can expect to be abused. He said that. We can expect it. I understand that. We can expect to be abused. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be criticized. And we're going to be criticized by the people we go to church with. We're going to be criticized by the people who call themselves Christians. We're going to be criticized by our family and by our fellow workers. I know that. It's going to happen. God said it. That's okay. If the people in Hebrews 11 can take what they took, I can take that. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 3, God will prosper his remnant. Micah 2, 12, we can make a great noise. We can make a great noise in this world. Zephaniah 2, 9, we can have a great, we can have great victory. Great victory. I'm looking forward to that. That's exciting to me. Romans 9, 27, God has some people left. Romans 11, 4, and 5. God has some people left. And I'm asking you tonight, are you one of them? Just like then, so it is today. Doesn't look like there's many, but there's some. Are you in that group? Who's on the Lord's side? You know what Moses said? Let him come. Let him come here. Have you been on the Lord's side? Have you bowed your knee? Baal disguised as a God of the Bible. Do you come and tell the Lord you are on his side? Bow your knee, your heart to him? I just asked you what Moses said. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. I'm asking you tonight, if you're going to tell God, I will not. I refuse to bow my knee to Baal. I will not be part of this watered-down Christianity. That's taking the standards of the Bible and watering them down. Taking the standards that have worked all through the years and watering them down. I will not be a part of that. I will not be a part of a watered-down Christian life. But I will stand with the God of the Bible as we go forward to fight <coughs> for the souls of people. I'm going to ask you tonight. Come and kneel here or in your pew and tell God, I'm on your side. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. Teenager, I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you to make a decision tonight. Say, I'm on the Lord's side. Remember, the closer you get to God, the holier you live. Put it in practical terms, that means the higher standards you have. You see, the farther you stay away from this crazy world. You're on the Lord's side tonight. He needs people. Like I said before, the world doesn't go for this watered-down Christianity. They look at you and me and they say, if we're, we're living like that, they say, what do you got? We don't have. All you talk about is God. We don't talk about God, but we got the same life you have. I want them to see something different in me. I want to be clear that I am on God's side. I want it to be clear with my life. I hope you do too. So we're going to have an invitation song in just a moment. Now, if you're at night and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you heard a lot of stuff tonight you probably never even knew that was in the Bible. You probably never even knew that Christians stood for these things. That, and I'm sorry you had to hear that. Well, I'm not sorry you had to hear that, but 
I just want to tell you, you need to become a Christian. Most important decision I ever made in my life is when I asked Jesus to save me, to give me the gift of eternal life. Because no matter what, you, whether you agree with me or not, the fact is you are a sinner. The fact is you deserve to go to hell and pay for your sins. That's what God said. The fact is God loves you, and Jesus Christ came to earth to die for your sins, pay your penalty so you can go to heaven. The fact is eternal life is a gift from God. And the fact is that Jesus Christ was taken off the cross dead, laid in the tomb, and three days later he walked out of that tomb to prove to us he was who he said he was, the Savior of the world, the God-man. And the fact is, if you call on him and ask him to save you, he'll save you, he'll give you eternal life as a gift. And if you never do that, the fact is you'll burn forever in the lake of fire, forever and forever and forever. And the fact is, God doesn't want you to do that. God's not willing that you should perish. He wants you to be saved. But it's up to you. It's your choice. You can do that. You can get saved. Just admit. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.